morning, everyone. I um, hope I can get my 30 seconds back anyway. Uh, I was uh, thinking uh, today about being on Zoom again and missing being inside of the sanctuary. And I seldom respond to the prompt, what did you hear today? Uh, but I couldn't help but laugh. And I hope you'll indulge me when Lynn was reading the, the epistle of, from, from Paul and the Corinthians. And, and she used the term private parts. Uh, the King James Version says the parts of our bodies that are more feeble. But it was interesting that this particular version asked for private parts. And I'll draw your attention to that because there is a certain amount of shame that comes when we think about private parts that may not be as provoked when we think about the members of the body that we do consider to be more feeble. And the, the feeble aspects of our body are the things that go unnoticed. Uh, the, the word, there's a word there called respect, more respectable. And respectable to from spectacle or spec to see, to respect literally means to see again. And so there are things in our life, uh, the things that we declare or consider to be very significant. Sometimes it's fame or wealth, the prominent. These are things we see without really having to pay attention. They're just there. And they're obvious. And then there are things that are private or secret. And these things kind of go unnoticed. But respectability or respecting is a very intentional way of being in the world. It suggests that I pay attention, not just to see, but to see again, it's an examination. It's an intentional awareness. I respect you. I see you and before I make judgment, I'm going to look again. I'm going to see if I can really understand who you are. And so the epistle here of Paul is calling our attention to the members of the body I remember in the 90s, I had taken ill around 1994. And I've never really been ill in my life, but this particular time I thought I had a flu and, or a cold, but it had gone on for days. And I'm, I'm not one who's really nauseated. In fact, I've only been nauseated to the point of manifestation twice in my life, which is kind of, you know, interesting, but this particular time I got really sick and my friend came over to take me to the hospital. I went into the hospital with like 104 temperature and I was walking around. The next thing I know, they come in with a, uh, a gurney and they pull me back to the back of the emergency room and say, your kidneys are failing. And, and they rushed me to another hospital. But anyway, as I was becoming ill, I had a lot of pain in my body and after being in the hospital a few days and it was hurting me to breathe, my lung began to collapse. And it was strange to me that my lung would collapse because I was not in the hospital for a collapsing lung. But what was happening is because it was hurting me to breathe, I was compensating by not breathing as much and my lung was not getting the exercise it needed or the rehearsal it needed. I would say. And so it began to fail me, a very weak muscle. And then this is strange because my body was working against itself. It, it had become dis-eased, dis -eased, And it had become to be at war with itself. No, we was, my body was in a sense studying war. It was at odds with itself and it was failing because I had pain. I was trying to fix it. So interestingly enough, when we read these passages and we think about the things that are respectable, we have Jesus 
almost by surprise in Galilee and also in Nazareth. But when he speaks in Galilee, the news spreads. There's this guy that's talking and people are fascinated with him. So he goes to, to Nazareth and he opens up the scroll. You know, the scroll isn't in a codex like we have now. It couldn't go like to Isaiah 5 and 3. There was no Isaiah 5 and 3. There was just a scroll. So he had to unroll it. And then I, who knows why he happened upon this text. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Who knows? I don't. But here he is. And he's talking about liberating the poor and setting free those who are captive the people that we tend not to notice. But Jesus' attention when the spirit of the Lord is upon him seems to be focused on those who are oppressed, perhaps because those are the people who go neglected or unattended to or unrespected, maybe disrespected. We don't tend to see them as viable, as real as significant contributors to the human event. And humanity is an event that's happening to the world. It's an event, it's an advent that continues to happen in the world. But what I really love in Paul's epistle, he said that I can say to the ear, I have no need of you, but he goes on to say the head can't say to the feet, I have no need of you. Now, who is the head of the body? Jesus. Now, how wonderful is that? That Jesus needs you. It's essentially saying there is no Jesus without you, without me, without us. How different is the world, is the body, is St. Michael's. When we see each other, when we respect each other, like for real. And we are no longer extricated or not tethered, or we don't see, we begin to see how tethered we are to each other. Now that is a human event that is Absolutely amazing. Absolutely amazing. These are things that go through me from way beyond what's not of me. The tonal influence of symphony and melodies that move in harmony, rhythms and rhymes, seasons and time, poise and reflection, tenuous selections, the choice to be friends, to brave the distance, to love with no end, to conquer resistance. These are things that go through me. Your life from God into me. A life exchanged for a new me. And a world that's better because you touched me. Amen. Amen.